All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome good to Good Measure. My name is David and I'll be your host today. Today, we have Brett Flegg, Senior Staff Engineer and Tech Blogger at Google. He's here today to talk with us about Google and his, and his experiences in the tech space. Brett, thank you so much for being here with us today. Do you mind quickly introducing yourself to those in the audience who may not be familiar with you and your work? Yeah, uh, of course, David. Uh, so uh, my name's Brett. I uh, actually grew up in a small farming town in, in Canada and uh, uh, eventually went to the, the University of Waterloo and did my degree in, in math and computer science. And then uh, for the last two decades, I've, I've lived in the Seattle area, uh, working at various uh, tech companies, start startups and tech companies. Um, so now um, I currently work as a, a senior staff engineer at Google. Uh, developing services to help companies, uh, enterprises mostly, uh, modernize their their IT infrastructure, so to be able to move to the cloud. Um, and I, I work, uh, you know, senior staff engineer. It's, it's uh, as an architect. I I joke as an architect. I draw boxes and arrows and write documents that nobody reads. Uh, it but basically you, you can kind of think of as a, an architect uh, as as the. I don't have direct reports, right? So I don't have people mm -hmm. directly reporting to me, but I'm responsible for actually helping to shape and drive the technology investments and, and okay. setting basically the, the technical mm -hmm. investments for, for, for hundreds of engineers. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do with the Google Cloud Platform and why over 940,000 companies choose to use this platform? And what exactly does a scalable cloud provider like the Google Cloud Platform provide to a company? Yeah, no, totally. Um, you can kind of think the computing industry always goes goes through evolutions, right? But, but you can actually look back at a lot of things in the past and, and kind of equate them to, to what we've done. So you can kind mm -hmm. of think of as, you know, when electricity was first invented, right? Or power mm -hmm. in general, right? You used to have like the, the mill, the sawmill had to be located right next to the river or, you know, companies started actually developing their own power plants that they used to run inside of their own organizations to, and mm -hmm. they thought that was a competitive advantage to basically do that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, along came the power plant and nobody would think of running a power plant themselves to, you know, they, they get power from the electrical grid. And, mm -hmm. and you can kind of think of as, as the evolution of computers is the same way. Like Google uh, has this massive data, uh, data center presence around the world, right? And, and we mm -hmm. have spare computing capacity and we have a way to allow to enable basically running running of software and so you know mm -hmm. instead of companies running th things inside of their own data center we provide the ability for them to to run it uh run their services uh inside of the google cloud which uh kind of think of it as the, the power plant of of the internet mm -hmm. right and uh it allows us to do it actually at, you know because we run at such scale it allows it to be done cheaper it allows it to be done a lot more efficiently and um more invent environmentally friendly right with, with mm -hmm. the way that we kind of run our data centers okay and so Speaking about your work, um, you have a you have a very um, I'd say um, amazing and interesting blog, and so I'd like to focus a bit about um, a topic on there, um, which is Parkinson's law. Um, and in your blog post called Parkinson's law, you talk about maximizing effort while minimizing the amount of time that we put into said task. Could you explain a little bit more about the thought process behind how backlogging commitments, breaking down tasks, rewarding efforts, celebrating failure? And believing in the possible is so important for a team success. Like, how does it boost an employee slash engineer's willingness to contribute and work towards a task completion? And how that could also apply to a different situation, like for a student or someone who's doing a research project. Yeah, totally. So yeah, Cyril Parkinson, which wrote about it, it's it's kind of fun. He was a British historian and or a naval historian, and he he basically back in in 1955 he wrote that work tends to expand to fill the the, the space to fill its completion, right? So mm -hmm. it's, in other words, like if you say it's gonna take you, like if you are given a week to do an assignment, you're probably mm -hmm. gonna take a week to do an assignment. And and whether that means you're actually working efficiently for that entire week or you're procrastinating the whole time and then just trying mm -hmm. to cram it all in at the last minute, right? It, it you know, the, the idea is that, you know, you, you'll always find things that you can add to it or change it, right? You'll edit it at mm -hmm. extra times where, you know, if you, you shorten the amount of time that you have to do something, you may do it just as well, right? Or, or at least just as efficiently as the mm -hmm. outcome. Um, and, and so that's kind of the concept and it, it applies, you can imagine how that applies at scale when you're, when you're dealing mm -hmm. with hundreds of engineers, if you, yeah. if you require engineers to be able to say like, mm -hmm. to like to sign in blood that they're gonna get something done, uh, mm -hmm. you know, two weeks from today, they're going to pad that estimate, right? And, and so that estimate that gets pad over time uh, really uh, uh, 
it really means a whole lot of inefficiencies that get introduced. And so that's actually really important for your job, right? Because you're in charge of managing all these scientists. So it, for you, this is actually really important, right? Because you have to figure out how to actually put set a time limit and set like a sort of task, but you don't want to encourage, you don't want to encourage something like procrastination, right? You want to figure that's out how to like sort of encourage the engineers to do as much work in the most efficient time possible, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and fail fast, right? Like mm -hmm. th there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with failing, right? Like, especially, mm -hmm. you know, when you're doing new things, yeah, it's, it's, it's much better to find out in a couple of days that something you're building isn't going to work than finding out, you know, two months later that something you've just spent a whole lot of resources on isn't going to work. And mm -hmm. so trying to, trying to set the, the way where you encourage people to try things and fail mm -hmm. and, and learn from them and then grow uh, and, and then try the next thing on the list or, and, and mm -hmm. make iterative improvements ends up being super important mm -hmm. on, on how we approach mm -hmm. kind of big problem solving at scale. And speaking about like approaching failure. So at, at, at such a big company like Google, when, when you approach this sort of concept of failure, like how do you usually like attack it? Like do you, do you not, not necessarily encourage it, but like how do you like help somebody bounce back from a failure so fast? And so and how key is that? Part, part of it is not really thinking as a failure is a failure, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's talking about what you've learned and how you can improve from it. And, mm -hmm. and I can tell you like it, it's not, you know, somebody, somebody who dreams big and tries something and goes for it, you know, th those are the type of things that, that, and, and even if they don't get to where they're going, they've probably learned a whole lot along the way and that, that they can share and grow. And so there's always this opportunity to, even with projects that are quote unquote failures, there, there's a ton mm -hmm. you can learn on it and, and celebrate about it as, mm -hmm. as we work with folks. Could you quickly touch about the idea of believing them possible? That was yeah. something that was yeah. really, really interesting to me. So, you know, when I've taken on some of these really complicated projects that are like, you know, there, there, have, there have been projects that I've done in my life that I just don't believe are actually we're going to be successful on, mm -hmm. right? You know, they're, they're so big that you just don't think you're going to be able there. What I find is helping, breaking that down into meaningful steps that you can actually visualize and actually make your way towards and, and be able to work with a team to celebrate those steps as you get there, that mm -hmm. really builds confidence in what you're doing. Like some, some of the, some of the most fun moments in my working career have been doing impossible mm -hmm. tasks and working harder than I ever thought I would ever work on something because I was so excited about what we were doing and how we were making progress. So, mm -hmm. so in other words, like, you know, if you have this massive task, well, break, break it up into something that you can actually aim for and celebrate and integrate as a team with mm -hmm. early and, and, you can celebrate that and, and it actually motivates and it reinvigorates you to do that mm -hmm. next step and, and things like that. So, right. Whereas if you just tell people, look, you have to have this giant task done in X number mm -hmm. of months they, they may not even want to try, right. If, mm -hmm. if you don't believe you're going to be able to accomplish something, you're, you're not going to put in the effort mm -hmm. to try to get it done. So like, let's say like I have a thesis paper, right. And it's, I've got this massive month to do it, but what, what, what you would sort of encourage would be if I'm interpreting this, right. Is I split up. So just do like, a few days just to get the ideas down a few like a week or so to do the research and then one week to do all the writing and then just like the last few days just to do intensive editing and revising right and so yep. that would basically break it up you feel a sense of accomplishment over the way and it just sort of encourages you to move on to the next step right that, that's that's right. Yeah. Like, I, no, ex exactly. And and even you you can split it up into pieces that are complete in and of their own rights, right? So if you mm -hmm. have a massive term paper, write a one pager on it instead, mm -hmm. right? Like what would a one pager summarizing your idea look like? If you can mm -hmm. write the summary first and then break it up and then go in and expand on it into the various sections and mm -hmm. and take another shot at doing it. And and breaking it up into those pieces, I think, can really be encouraging so you can see progress along the way. Mm -hmm. And so like speaking about like learning and theses, um about students, it seems that like these days, like a lot of my peers and me as well, like we're really worried about our GPA and like what school we have to go to, to, to get our dream job. Like, I feel like we've lost a certain touch and we're all just focused on these tiny things, but there's so much other ways we can grow. And like, as someone who's been in like this massive position and what would be like a dream job for many, like what, what can you say about our generation? And how do you think like, technology and outside pressures to perform have changed the way that we find the ideal route to dream job and like, what do you yeah. think is important? So, yeah. no, it, it's a good question. I was thinking about this. Um, 
you know, well, one of the things I would note is almost none of the stuff that you're learning is going to be relevant in 10 years, mm -hmm. right? It, it, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're like the specifics of what you're learning, you know, if you're learning a language mm -hmm. or you're learning this other thing, I, I'm in college, I had to learn this horrible, horrible language called Modula 3, which, which nobody would ever use in their right mind. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the point of what you're doing is actually learning, like the point of school in my mind is about learning how to learn, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's honestly the biggest skill that you're going to take away is how, how do you take these challenging concepts and, and mm -hmm. help motivate yourself to get through them and, and learn the things. So it like the bigger picture of this whole thing, honestly, is, is the learning how you learn. And mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a better way to do it than the school system that we've got. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it may not be the most efficient way to do it, but it's the mm -hmm. best way we've got to date on it. And, and so, you know, taking the time and focusing on what you're learning and doing the best that you can on each step of it, I think is the critical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, speak about sort of like growth right and it, on your blog you've written a lot about like your thoughts and your self-growth and there's a post called write more and talk less and how you identified yourself at, at the beginning as someone who like talks to think and i i love the idea that you have shared the power of writing and how do you think like after beginning to write this blog your thought process has uh, or communication skills have changed so I'm still not great at it. I, like, mm -hmm. I, like I'm, I, I'm genetically unable to spell. I've got ADD. I, I find it really hard to sit down and, and try to write, uh, you know, and, and I find, I find I do my best communicating, uh, you know, talking through ideas. And I, like, I, I literally talk to think, right. I, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to think to talk. Um, but what I've found is, you know, there, it's, it's more about taking a skill that I, that I need to improve on and, and focusing on it. Right. And, and spending mm -hmm. the time to do it. And I find it rewarding, right? Like, to, mm -hmm. you know, being able to sit down and actually, you know, I, I mentor a lot of folks, but I can mentor one person at a time. I can write a mm -hmm. blog and have a thousand people read it. Right. It's yeah. uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty awesome where the, you know, the extent that you can reach and, and do things. And so it's been, I found it really rewarding and it's been ex in, in, entirely like immensely useful in my job, right? In mm -hmm. Google, we're very much a good document based culture. And so, mm -hmm. you know, to share ideas, like I, I have teams in Israel and Poland and the U S and, and to, to share ideas with a dispersed group of people, it makes sense to write it mm -hmm. down, share it, get comments, feedback, and then improve. And, and mm -hmm. so honestly, the, the work I've been doing on the blog has been super useful in my day to day, day, -to -day work. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad I, I kind of do it. And so talking about focus, like, as someone like who's still like learning how to learn to say it this way, like I find it really hard as a student sometimes just to sit down and immerse myself. Like, so like it, it during your process as, as learning, what have you found is like super intriguing or new for you? When so it comes to learning? The, the one thing, the one, one advantage of doing a blog as opposed to doing something for school is that I, mm -hmm. I get to do the stuff that I'm passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I can start writing something and realize, man, this isn't really what I'm passionate about and I can set it aside and then go write something else, right? And mm -hmm. so keeping a backlog of topics that I want to write on and doing things and, and, and focusing what I'm passionate about. I, I was thinking, and, it, and maybe it goes back to the previous question that you had, but I, I had... Yeah. Uh, a lot of the people that I went to college with, uh, you know, computer, a lot of people went to computer science at that time because, hey, it's this new and upcoming field and my parents want me to do it and I'm going to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? And th those people didn't necessarily, some, of, a lot of those people are the people that didn't have passion for it. 20 mm -hmm. years later, aren't actually in the industry anymore. You know, they're, they, they were able to find other areas that they were passionate about. So one became a ballet instructor and the other became a real estate mogul in Toronto. It, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it, but it's about finding what you're passionate on and being able to, to spend your energy on that or to be able to take a task that you're doing and figure out the aspect of it that you're passionate about and be able to focus on that aspect of it, I think is really mm -hmm. important. I think um, something that was really interesting for me was your actual, um, I think it was one of your more recent posts, is the 90 days of Google posts. I think something that's really interesting to me is how one of your ideas of growth and how is to make a decision at Microsoft. You need just need to convince one executive with a good chair chucking skill, and yeah. but at Google you need to convince half the company that an idea is good before getting any traction. Can you talk yep, yep. a bit about that? I thought that was really cool. So, and really interesting. so yeah, it's um, I, I and I, man, I'm still learning uh, on the way to do it. It's you know different companies have different orgs, you know different mm -hmm. orgs and different kind of ways that they do things. And in Google or say in Microsoft. Uh, mm -hmm. where I spent a whole lot of years, it's very much kind of a top-down structure, right? So mm -hmm. you can have an idea at the bottom, but what yeah. you need to do is convince a VP that this is the right way to go. And, and then 
the VP will work to align everybody in the organization towards the idea. Mm -hmm. In Google, it's it's entirely the other way around, right? Anybody in the company can and does have an idea. And instead of mm -hmm. trying to convince a VP to make it happen, they need yeah. to find the people around them and basically form a group and use your 20% time to go start mm -hmm. coding it and deliver it, right? And try mm -hmm. test it out and see how it works and, and let let the market and what you're doing um, mm -hmm. happen. And, and there's, 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 there are awesome advantages with that approach, mm -hmm. right? On, on this bottoms up, uh, some mm -hmm. inefficiencies at times, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I think maybe sometimes it can take Google a little bit longer to materialize a solution, but ultimately when that, that solution ends up going to, to, to the world, mm -hmm. it's been well thought through and you've got mm -hmm. incorporated ideas from lots of different folks. And it's not really the loudest person in the room that solves the problem. It's a group of people coming together to solve mm -hmm. the problem, which I think can be really, uh, really beneficial. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, speaking about like just the thought process, or not really thought process, but the process behind how Google gets an idea out into the world. For for me, something that's been really interesting is um, my journey, and I've been trying to learn um, coding actually myself. Mm -hmm. So I was I was thinking of that. So. And, and, and nowadays the internet is such a massive place and there's so much resources. And so if, if someone like me, who's pretty relatively new, I've done it for a few months now, but to coding, how would you tell me, not exactly tell me, but recommend me to learn coding and, or like this way, how would you relearn coding in this day yeah, and age? I was thinking about that. I, I mean, to, Man, it's you know when I started, it was is with was with an old com computer with a floppy disk, and and I was like coding games out of a book, right, and, mm -hmm. and just trying it and learning from it. And honestly, I think that's that same model still can be super useful. It's it's about mm -hmm. finding something that you're interested in doing, and and just going and looking at the resources and starting to cobble together and piece together part of what you'd like to build. If you you know mm -hmm. whether it be starting on scratch or doing Python or Minecraft or something like that. It, th those are actually mm -hmm. all really good platforms to start on because you can actually go and look at what the community is built and then start mixing and matching what the community is built to build your mm -hmm. own solution, right? Um, and then, you know, as as you start building up the confidence and understanding the pieces, you know, you, you can start to do more things and, and start writing applied programs to things that you're interested in. You know, if mm -hmm. you're, um, you know, write something that scrapes data off the internet and summarizes mm -hmm. it, right? Like, you know, if, if you're interested in data analysis, see if you can put together a website that that pulls data mm -hmm. from other websites together and presents it in, in a meaningful way, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's down to a single language or like, there, you're right, you can get into analysis paralysis about trying like hundreds different of the different technologies out there mm -hmm. um, and and not do anything, but just just pick one and try it and iterate and, and improve mm -hmm. and share it with the world and repeat, right? You just keep getting better. Mm -hmm. Well, that's basically it for the questions I have today. Thank you so much for being here. Is there anything that you'd like to shout out? Anything you'd like to promote real quick? No, no, it's, uh, it, I, I appreciate what you're, you're, you're doing here and on bringing folks together to talk about this. So yeah, I, um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you today. I look, yeah, look forward to, to seeing where the, the, the podcast goes in the future. Thank you. Awesome.